everybody. This is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera here in Seattle. I hope you're all, all having a great Monday. Uh, we are continuing to celebrate our 85th anniversary here as an independent camera dealer in the Pacific Northwest. Um, each week we're bringing you different kinds of content focused on different brands, collaborating with different brands, um, and it's been a lot of fun so far. This is actually our fifth week, and this week's theme is really lenses. You know, a lot of times we think about the camera that we need, we don't always think about the lens we might want to get, or maybe we have too many lenses on that list of lenses that we want to purchase. Um, so this week we're collaborating with brands like Tamron to bring you different kinds of education, inspiration, um, and tips today, especially on tips on better wildlife photography. Um, before we dive into the session and I introduce our speaker, I do want to remind you of how you can ask questions. Um, during the session, if you have questions about the topic, we definitely want to hear from you. Um, these sessions are more energetic when we hear from you and we can ask your questions a little bit throughout and then a little bit more at the end. So don't be shy, ask your questions via the comments in the Facebook feed or the chat on YouTube, okay? One more quick announcement is be sure to sign up for these sessions. Um, maybe you've bookmarked things, maybe you're just adding them to your calendar on your own, but signing up gets you on the mailing list to receive the special super secret promotions happening in conjunction with our 85th anniversary. Um, this is, obviously we want to bring you lots of fantastic education by collaborating with these different brands, but there's also some great deals that open only happen once or twice a year. Those deals are available in store and also via those super secret emails. So if you haven't signed up, click that little box to say sign up so you can get that email that will go out shortly after the session wraps today. Um, so with all of that said, I'd love to introduce Jeff Allen, who's a Tamron Technical Representative. And today we're gonna spend some time talking about tips on better wildlife photography. So Jeff, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you and then we can dive into that presentation. Sure, uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me today and, and I appreciate uh, everything Glazers does uh, to support Tamron. Um, I'm, uh, let's see, a professional photographer. I've worked in almost every genre uh, of my degree says creative photography and you know that and six bucks will get you a big latte at the uh, at the coffee shop uh so a lot of on-the-job training i've i've uh, been a photojournalist worked for newspapers uh, i've worked behind the retail counter uh, for many years uh, a lot of a lot of things a uh, very uh, a huge variety of, of uh, professional shooting i've been teaching photographer for yeah, 30 years plus and uh, been shooting for a lot longer than that. So there's not too much I haven't encountered or, or uh, uh, been able to try out and, and do in my photography uh, efforts. So uh, I, I guess the, the, that's about it. Uh, Tamron Tech Jeff is my handle. You'll see that again in a moment on a slide. Uh, if, if we run short on time for any reason and you do have uh, a question, just drop me uh, a note at, uh, at any of the popular uh, uh, social media uh, sites. Social media. Thank you. Sometimes <laughs> So you said you hadn't had enough coffee. I haven't had I, any. We're in yeah, this together. No, <laughs> yeah, we're we're under caffeinated today. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'm working on adrenaline and that'll get me through the presentation. So anyway, okay. enough about me. Okay. Uh, I think we can we can probably get started. We also have uh, our uh, our local sales uh, sales representative, Ben Hutchinson, joining us. So uh, ben can uh, uh, can also answer questions or say hello and whatnot uh, throughout the presentation, and and uh, we'll we'll get you going. And if if you if you have a particularly uh, pertinent question, Kate will stop me, and we'll try and uh, we'll try and address it right away. And otherwise, we will try and uh, keep some question and answer time open uh, at the uh, at the end of the presentation too. So, uh, I get, do you have anything else, Kate? No, we're good. Uh, thank All you, right. Jeff and Ben, uh, for helping make this happen. And uh, John Cornicello, who's uh, a photographer here in the Northwest, did mention he bought a Tamron 100 to 400 yesterday. So, oh, excellent! <laughs> Selling choice. some lenses, guys. Um, uh. All right. Uh, 
so Matt, who's tuned into many of our live sessions, also saying hello. So uh, yeah, I say uh, let's get that presentation going, and we'll do some Q and A throughout. All right, uh, you should be you should be seeing my uh, my title slide pop up on the screen here. I'm I'm watching myself on the on the YouTube feed, but there is a little delay there, so we'll hope all that's working. And I'll just uh, I'll just keep uh, yammering on here. Again, we're going to talk uh, today about the Tamron Guide to Better Wildlife Photography. Once again, thanks to our uh, our hosts at Glazers and congratulations on their 85th anniversary from all of us at Tamron. That's uh, you know it's a family owned business and what more can you say? It keeps the uh, keeps the uh, the local economy humming and and we like to uh, we like to support local dealers for sure. So again, I'm Tamron Tech Jeff. Uh, feel free to follow me or again drop me a note if you have a question that comes up maybe after hours or something. I'm I'm always happy to help. We're going to get started with some camera basics, controlling your camera settings. Uh, when you get out in the field, um, it's important to be comfortable and familiar with your camera. Now, uh, I never know, especially in, on the web-based uh, presentations, uh, the level of experience our, our viewers have. So uh, I'm going to go through some basics for you grizzled veterans. This is probably a, a, a simplified overview, but, uh, you know, it, it may be handy for the folks uh, who are new to changeable lens cameras and adjustable camera photography. Um, you have to know what makes the camera tick in order to get the image that you want to, uh, uh, that you're envisioning uh, onto the uh, onto the sensor, out of the camera, onto your computer screen, and I hope also uh, on the best of your photos, please make prints. They don't have an off switch. Uh, they have a lot more longevity than your uh, than your hard drive does. So for your best photos, again, uh, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, although I do in some events, but make prints. They've, they've got longevity and your kids and your grandkids will thank you for it. Plus, uh, for, for the now, they make great gifts also. Uh, make prints, make enlargements and, uh, you know, uh, put them together nicely in a mat board or a frame. And, and uh, you know, with the holidays coming up, what a great gift to give. So camera modes, um, you have a, a camera uh, that has a, a dial that looks like this, or it might be an LCD panel or something on the top of the back, uh, but it's going to have probably a green auto mode. Um, it may, uh, it, it'll certainly have program uh, AV aperture priority, TV shutter priority, manual, the dreaded manual, we will talk about it. Uh, and those are the kind of things uh, that you want to be familiar with. Now, if you're new to photography and you're on that auto mode, that's great. It can be your best friend, but you don't want it to be your best friend forever uh, because the camera doesn't know what your intention is. You can end up with a perfectly exposed blur and, and um, it might be the most artistic photo you ever created, but might not be what you're intending to make. So uh, taking over control of the camera is important to getting the best photos to being more successful and to, again, coming home with what you envisioned. Uh, you can move to program modes where you have a little bit of control. Also, a lot of cameras have uh, scene modes where you have little icons. And again, this may be a dial on the on the camera, or it may be in the LCD display somewhere. If you're not sure about any of these things, of course, the uh, the professionals at Glazer are always uh, happy to answer questions for you if you're uh, if you're in the neighborhood. Uh, if not, of course, you can also refer to your owner's manual. Uh, or most of the camera body makers also have a YouTube channel that uh, will have uh, feature and function descriptions of almost all the cameras in the line. Usually they'll break it down either by model or by groups of models that have similar functions. So uh, easy ways to, to find out how to make those work. If you're going to the scene mode, you'll probably see, uh, and this is for wildlife photography, probably the scene mode you'd want to use where there's a little uh, kind of a, a, a 
running person kind of icon. That's the action photography mode. There might be a little mountain, which would be for uh, landscape photography or distances. There might be a little flower for close-ups, maybe a head and shoulders for uh, for portrait photography. And again, those can help you get to where you want to go. And, and going back to when I learned photography back in the manual camera, manual exposure, manual focus film days, uh, I took little spiral notebooks with me out into the field and every photo I took, I wrote down the information, uh, the shutter speed I used, the aperture I used, the lens I used. The camera all records that for you now electronically. So you have that uh, data on every photo you've taken. So you can refer back to the successful ones and say, oh, here's what I did. I was successful. And then, you know, more importantly, we all learn more from the mistakes than we do from the successes. When the ones that didn't turn out the way you wanted, you can say, okay, the camera was set with this aperture, this shutter speed, this ISO, and it didn't work out. And then you have to uh, figure out next time what to do to overcome that. So that's kind of what I'm here to help with today too. Um, the exposure triangle, you may have heard of it, you may love it, you may hate it, but these are the controls, the basics that the camera gives you to control and get it, to get a good exposure. Uh, the ISO, that's the camera sensors, sensitivity to light. And these will be numbers like 50, 100, 200, 400, and so on. Uh, and you may have fractional numbers in between that too. Uh, but that's how sensitive the camera is to light. The lower the number, the less sensitive, but uh, there are some benefits to that that I'll explain momentarily. Shutter speed, of course, that's that fraction of a second that the shutter, or, or seconds long, that the shutter you know, opens and then closes to give you the uh, exposure uh, via that capability. You also have an aperture. That's the, that's the diameter of the lens. You have an uh, 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 a diaphragm inside each lens that opens up and stops down. That's the, the term photographers use for letting more or less light through. So again, moving on, uh, apertures can be a little bit counterintuitive because it's a mathematical formula. The aperture is, is a, a fractional uh, uh, function of the diameter of the lens versus the focal length of the lens. And here it's counterintuitive because the smaller number represents the, the large aperture, the large volume of light that's going to come through the lens. And uh, as we stop down to the smaller apertures, of course, uh, it's a bigger number, but the smaller volume of light comes through. Now, also with the graphic there that we've prepared, um, the small numbers, the large apertures, also give you what we call short depth short or shallow depth of field. Uh, that's the, the ability to isolate the subject uh, from the background. So there are times when you want to do that. And uh, when you go to the, when you stop down to the large apertures or the small apertures, I should say the big numbers, then you're going to have more in focus in front and behind, which you focused on. So this is important to go out and experiment with. Uh, here's kind of one of your first uh, assignments, go out and go to the backyard or a neighborhood park or somewhere or on your next outing and experiment with different apertures and review on your camera or review them on the computer on a bigger screen when you get home to see what happens as you change aperture in the scene. Uh, the shutter speed, of course, a little more straightforward. Again, just fractions of a second or seconds. The higher number, uh, the faster that action uh, stopping capability is with the shutter. Now we have a thousandth down to a half second here on the graphic, but certainly a lot of cameras can go much longer than that. Most cameras can go to 15 or 30 seconds if you need them for log exposures. And it's not uncommon now to find cameras that have uh, the ability to go to 2000, the 4000, or even 1 8000th of a second for those high shutter speeds for action stopping capability. And then the third graphic there on the bottom again is the ISO. Again, the lower the number, the better your color saturation, the better the contrast, the better the sharpness. But with low ISOs, because the sensor is less sensitive to light, uh, it requires longer shutter speeds or larger apertures or both to get the correct exposure. So it's a tightrope act. Uh, a lot of newer cameras even have the ability, if you want to go to 
the manual exposure mode of having auto ISO and let that be your automatic for portion. So if you want, or if you're shooting a specific scene and you want to make sure that you're stopping action uh, at a thousandth of a second and that you want to be able to shoot at F8 so you have uh, the uh, depth of field or the area in focus that you want, you can then tell the camera. And again, this is owner's manual or, uh, or body maker's YouTube channel time to find out how to set this. Not every camera has it, but almost all the newest cameras do. Um, and uh, again, you can set that ISO to vary automatically. Now you do want to set a top end because sometimes it'll surprise you and give you a stupid high ISO uh, that that can cause other uh, sharpness or, or image quality problems later on. So uh, there are limits and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, again, here's kind of a, a quick depth of field uh, a reminder again that large aperture uh, that pretty blue flower is nice and sharp and in focus and the background is completely indistinct and then as we stop down you can see that piece of garden furniture in the background now maybe that furniture could be moved maybe it can't maybe you can move left or right or up or down to get it out of the frame maybe you can't uh, so aperture here is going to be your friend a small aperture uh, f16 f22 you're going to have that annoyance in the background and it's taking the viewer's eye away uh, from your intended subject so you may want to open up and and again this is a beautiful thing about digital photography as you can see on your view screen as you're shooting uh do i have the aperture i want is everything i want in or out of focus so it's it's very easy to experiment so again that's why it's important to go out and experiment with your camera and lens or lenses uh, to see what those relationships are and how they're going to work as you shoot and another little rule of thumb wider angle lenses the shorter focal lengths are going to have uh aperture are going to have inherently more depth of field so f 2.8 on say a 24 millimeter focal length is going to have a lot more depth of field than f 2.8 on say a 200 millimeter focal length um, and that's again just the physics of the way the light bends through the lenses so important to experiment Shutter speeds. Again, these are some starting points, and this is where uh, you might want to do a screen grab with your camera if you want to, uh, or even just, you know, pick up the phone and, and grab a quick shot off the screen uh, to, uh, to get these. But these are some suggestions, some starting points. Again, if your subject is motionless, you can go with those short, longer shutter speeds. Uh, but as the subject begins to move, you're going to need to go to higher and higher shutter speeds. Birds in flight, uh, if you want to freeze those feathers nice and sharp you probably want to be at a thousandth of a second or higher if you want a little motion blur to the uh to the wings or to the feathers uh a 500th or maybe a 250th of a second as you can see this shot uh is is at a thousandth of a second and everything is nice and tack sharp there all the way out to the to those tiny very fast moving feathers at the at the tip of the of the uh the hawk's wings now this is a captive animal uh with a uh, raptor rehabilitation group that was flying between two handlers uh, and again here we're at a thousandth of a second we're at a fairly large aperture so the bird is isolated from that nice fall color in the background um and again you can see exactly what the photographer's intention was when uh when that shot was made ISO sensitivity. And again, this is something you might want to do a quick screen grab or take a quick photo of. Again, the lower ISO uh, is going to give you better color, better sharpness, better saturation. But depending upon the subject and what they're doing, you may need to go to a higher ISO. Uh, typically, if I'm shooting moving subjects outdoors, I'm going to be at a 400 uh, to 800 ISO setting. And I've experimented with my camera, and those settings work just fine with my camera. Uh, as the light diminishes more, like, say, uh, this night sky shot uh, of, the, of the galactic core of the Milky Way rising, I had to go to an ISO 3200 setting in order to have enough sensitivity in the sensor. And this is a 30 second long exposure. Uh, at 30 seconds, it still needed ISO 3200 to give me that, uh, that nice sharp image that I was looking for. So uh, again, newer cameras, uh, and, and this is where money can come into play. More expensive cameras, generally are going to perform better at those high ISOs. Sony just introduced a new camera. Uh, if you're a Sony shooter, the uh, the 7S3. Uh, and uh, 
the S series cameras from Sony's have a native ISO of 51,200. They're purpose built for shooting video and for shooting very low light images. And other cameras don't have native ISOs. Most cameras are going to have a native ISO of somewhere around one or 200. So again, uh, that's a special tool. And again, here's a little guide. This isn't wildlife, but a, a good example. And this is another good uh, experiment for you. Go out and find your personal comfort level with your ISO sensitivity in your camera. Um, and nighttime shots like this, you don't need high ISOs you, unless, again, you need to stop action sometimes, uh, or, if, or if you have distant pinpoints of light like stars. But uh, here, now, again, you can see there was, there was a time difference. Uh, the marine layer where the fog and, and overcast hadn't moved in with this ISO 50 shot. So I've got a nice moonrise and a, a plane flying into the airport there. Um, and then as the, the fog layer moved in, of course, the wind came up too, as you can see. So we, we lose that glassy water. This is a, this again, a, a, I think a 20 or 30 second exposure. These uh, exposures at ISO 30, 200 and 3200 and 12,800 are at uh, you know different shutter speeds and different exposure times. And again, that's all part of the experimentation. But what I recommend for your camera is to go out, shoot a bunch of different uh, scenes, maybe you know late afternoon, dusk, or getting into dark like this. Come home, look at them on your computer, but I recommend going to the next step. Maybe make some eight by tens and see. So uh, the print's really gonna tell you more than even your computer screen will just what the sensitivity or what your comfort level is going to be. Now, with most of the cameras I own right now, uh, I can still make acceptable prints at 1600 uh, and, you know, reasonable size enlargements up to 3200. But beyond that, I'm probably not going to make big prints uh, or maybe no prints at all, or just simply use them on the computer where, again, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ISO sensitivity is a little less noticeable. I went out, in fact, a few weeks ago uh, to a nearby lake and did some just some uh, fun shots at sunset and dusk. Uh, the, the shot on the left of this great blue heron who was oh, probably 10 or 12 feet away from me, I was a respectful distance. So that's something also with wildlife. You want to keep your distance. If they start to change their behavior, you're too close. So take a step or two back. If you see them starting to spook or get nervous or look at you or look away from you or start looking around, uh, then you'll know that they're uh, they're uncomfortable with you. But this shot, again, right about sunset, uh, the bird was in the shadows and uh, 12,800 ISO at 125th of a second because I was also experimenting with my lens, my 150 to 600, just to see how good the stabilization was and also how good I I am hand holding. Now, uh, this was kind of a, a lower caffeine day for me, kind of like today where I hadn't had as much coffee. And caffeine does give you the jitters sometimes, and it can affect the slowest shutter speed you can use with any lens. But stabilization generally is going to give you that benefit uh, of being able to shoot handheld at longer and longer speeds. So that's, uh, I've hung myself up here. That can be a benefit. Um, and at 125th of a second, I've got a nice tack sharp. You always want to look for the, the animal's eye to make sure it's sharp. Uh, that's an important thing. You know, anytime you have a living, breathing being in the photo, you probably want a, a nice sharp eye. Uh, also, uh, I shot 15, 20 minutes later, uh, another heron had landed on a log out in the lake that, and the, the city that ha operates this lake or, or has control over it has put logs out and you can see that strap around it. They've anchored the logs so they'll float up and down with the water level, but it gives all the birds a place to, to roost away from the shore. And for a lot of birds, uh, that's how they uh, protect themselves from predators by being able to roost high in a tree or away from a uh, shoreline. And uh, it was getting really dark by this, again, 20 minutes plus after sunset. I went up to ISO 40,000 just for fun. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty noisy, uh, you know, if you're seeing this on a, on a big enough screen. 
Uh, I hope you're not watching on your phone today, but uh, uh, on, on a much larger, you know, anything much larger than a phone, you can see that both of these are noisy uh, and the noise in even a 12,800, especially in that underexposed or shadow area uh, is quite noticeable. It's a little less noticeable here because there's less shadow or, or underexposed area. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't make big prints from this, but on a computer screen, they look reasonably good. So experiment with your camera and see just or cameras and see just what they'll do. Now, stability is also important. I just mentioned image stabilization. Tamron calls it vibration compensation. Uh, it may be known as VR or IS or, uh, or you know, a few things, different things like that. Uh, but if you can, if the situation allows a tripod, and again, the folks at Glazers can uh, can work with you based on your budget and your shooting needs and the camera and lenses that you own to make to make recommendations of what's going to work best for you in tripods. And there's, you know, they they make dozens of tripods, uh, just like we make dozens of lenses, because uh, not everyone is going to serve the same purpose or be right for your situation. But uh, again, a tripod is a wonderful thing. It can give you more stability than the best stabilizers can. You can't shoot, for instance, that Milky Way shot handheld. You're just not going to be able to handhold a 30 second exposure, but you might be able to handhold a half second exposure with a stabilized lens. When you do go onto a, uh, a tripod, typically you'll want to turn the stabilizer off because when you stabilize the camera uh, and even if you're just putting it on a park bench or leaning on a or, you know laying it down on a rock out in the field um, the stabilizer looks for motion to compensate for and if the camera is just rock solid steady it's not going to see uh, the, the, the stabilization mechanism, whether, whether it's in the camera body, as a lot of the new mirrorless cameras offer, or if it's in the lens, as a lot of, you know, lenses, especially for uh, DSLR style cameras, uh, the, the stabilization is going to be in the lens. Again, the stabilizers can start to flutter if they don't see mo motion. So that's an important thing to, uh, to watch out for. Um, so turn the stabilizer off typically if you're if you're supported really steady. Now the other two tools you see here are a monopod, uh, especially for that log lens I, I picked up a minute ago, that 150 to 600. Often when I'm out in the field, if I'm moving around a lot and maybe a tripod's going to be too cumbersome, I'll at least bring a monopod along. It gives me a nice walking stick. And it also gives me uh, the ability when I stop and put the camera on the, on the monopod to take all the weight, and the tripod does this too, it takes all the weight and stress off of your shoulders, your back, your neck, your arms, your elbows, so you're not, uh, you know, if you're shooting for long periods of time, you don't want to be just crouched over like that uh, to, uh, to get a shot, uh, because by the end of the day, uh, you're going to be, you know, saying, ah, I hurt, I got to find a new hobby. Uh, monopods, tripods are also going to help you uh, be able to, to shoot for longer periods of time without stressing the, the muscles in your body out. And then the third item here is a, is a gimbal head. And again, a number of different price points uh, of gimbals. But what a gimbal head does is simply allows you to tilt back and forth, up and down very smoothly and to pan left and right very smoothly, especially for birds in flight and animals in motion. This can be a really handy tool when you're working on a tripod. I occasionally use it on a monopod, but more importantly on the tripod, it gives you much smoother movement to pan with the subject um, uh, or to tilt up and down and follow the subject in motion. And uh, uh, if you get serious about your wildlife uh, photography, especially if you're doing birds, uh, that that can be a really handy, handy tool to have. Uh, so again, talk to the folks at, uh, at, uh, at Glazers, or again, if you happen to be watching in another part of the country, another part of the world, uh, check with your local uh, Photoshop and uh, get good, uh, good advice on that. 
Now we'll talk uh, real quickly about uh, lens selection, which lens and why. I'm going to give you the nomenclature that Tamron uses because it's what I'm most familiar with. We make three different uh, uh, segments of lenses. We have our DI, DI2, DI3 lenses. The DI lenses are the full frame lenses. They're going to fit on uh, the prosumer and pro camera bodies that have the larger sensor size that's typically equivalent to about a 35 millimeter uh, film frame back from the day. Pardon me, time for a little sip there. And DI lenses can also be adapted to the largest variety of cameras. Um, if you're switching from a traditional DSLR to a mirrorless camera, there are adapters uh, provided you stay within the same brand. Or even if you're switching brands, there are aftermarket adapters. But the body maker, uh, for instance, this is a Nikon mount Tamron lens on a, uh, a Nikon mirrorless uh, Z series body, and we use their FTZ adapter for this particular one. And most all the Tamron lenses, most all the Nikon lenses, or if you're with Canon, um, and their adapters do the same thing, they'll keep all of the functionality native to the camera. So uh, if you change uh, models, you're going to be able to have the ability to not have to spend a fortune on new lenses right away. Most of your existing lenses might need a firmware update, uh, but they'll uh, they'll be able to travel along with you to the new camera. So uh, that's a that's a big benefit. Or say you want to try uh, putting, you know, uh, say a Nikon or, or Canon mount lens onto a Fuji camera or something like that. There are adapters. Again, the folks at Glazers can uh, can advise you on what's available, what they recommend uh, for doing some of those uh, more esoteric type adaptations. But the DI lenses are going to give you the most ability to fit the most uh, cameras. Now, DI lenses will also fit on APS-C or crop sensor cameras, but Tamron also makes, because these cameras tend to be smaller and lighter to begin with, we make a line of DI2 lenses. They put out a little smaller circle of light for that smaller sensor size. Typically, the sensor is about a third smaller. Now, again, these lenses can be adaptable uh, to other cameras via uh, via adapters like I just spoke about, uh, but maybe a little less so. Although, for just for fun, uh, my 18 to 400 that this shot was taken with, uh, I also have routinely been putting onto my uh, full frame uh, mirrorless camera uh, because it's smaller and lighter and I don't have all the pixels available on the sensor, but the camera recognizes and it works almost seamlessly uh, natively with the camera. So that, that's another uh, benefit. Again, you might be stepping up from uh, an APS sensor size camera to a full frame sensor camera. And a lot of the newer cameras, especially the mirrorless ones, will, uh, uh, will recognize that you have a small sensor lens even on the full sensor body and compensate for you and allow you to keep shooting. So that's another benefit. Uh, additionally, then we have our DI3. Now this is kind of an umbrella and the DI3 lenses right now in the Tamron line are any lens that fits on mirrorless cameras. Now, right now we've kind of focused our uh, R&D and marketing efforts on Sony mount uh, camera or lenses. Uh, so we have virtually a full line of Sony. We only have a few lenses for micro four thirds. In fact, just one, a 14 to 150. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have as much for uh, to offer you Olympus or Panasonic users right now, but uh, who knows what the future brings. And, uh, and then uh, we'll have, uh, again, a full line of these lenses uh, eventually for uh, where, you know, where we're able to be licensed and where the consumer demand takes us. So eventually uh, we'll have more than probably just the Sony mount. But again, right now, a lot of Sony mount lenses, including the new 70 to 300 that we just announced last week and will actually be delivering to stores uh, uh, probably. And again, this is a Sony mirrorless mount, the FE mount, uh, will be delivering to stores around the end of the month. So there's your there's your Halloween treat to put in your, uh, your trick-or-treat bag for uh, for the photographer in your life. 
So we'll start with wide angle lenses. Now for wildlife, you might not think a wide angle lens is gonna be a great choice, but depending again upon what your intention is in your photography, a wide angle can give you some really cool choices. Um, and you know, when I think in uh, wildlife, I'm not just thinking large mammals, uh, this little uh, uh, dragonfly, or, or again, I'm not big into herpetology or I think that's identifying identifying insects. Anyway, whatever identifying insects is, this little critter had landed on this uh, on this lily pad that I happened to be photographing kind of the uh, the lily pad in the pond, uh, but then the dragonfly landed on it. So it became instead of a, 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 a flora photo, it became a flora and fauna photo. So those kinds of things can be uh, uh, can be very cool for you if you're uh, if you're shooting uh, small wildlife or or things close up to you. A, a wide angle lens can give you those kinds of options. A wide angle lens can also give you an option like this. Uh, I I live in uh, in uh, Colorado. Uh, there is a national wildlife reserve near the Denver airport. So sometimes. Uh, coming or going, I'll try and plan for a little extra time before or after a flight, and I'll take a drive through the, the wildlife preserve. They have a herd of bison that they imported years ago when it be, first became a wildlife preserve. Prior to that, it was actually an old army uh, weapons depot, so uh, this is a nice repurposing of the land. And there's there's a scenic drive that you can take through, and it's almost 20,000 acres, so it's it's a big place, and you can see bison uh, kind of uh, on what looks like the prairie uh, 200 years ago. Uh, so those kinds of things can be very handy uh, for a wide angle lens where, and I, I've literally, uh, they don't let you get out of your car, obviously, for safety purposes. They want to protect the animals from the humans. Uh, but uh, again, just leaning right out the car window and, uh, and uh, you know, proving with that prairie grass, you really can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. Normal and prime lenses are going to be our next stop, and uh, I'm kind of going to kind of uh, uh, lump together uh, prime lenses because most of the Tamron primes tend to be in a in a relatively narrow focal range, from about uh, uh, 20 millimeter out to about 85 millimeter, depending upon the camera we're fitting, and then uh, also short zooms. So uh, kind of, again, a uh, uh, group together here. So 25, uh, 28 to 75 for Sony. You'll see a 24 to 70 from, uh, for traditional DSLRs in a moment. And again, that wide field of view or the wider field of view is going to lend itself uh, to kind of the big picture. Uh, this, this was shot as we were doing a, a bird photography shoot at a, a, at a at a wildlife and nature preserve down in Florida near the, the Cape Canaveral uh, Space Center in Titusville. And uh, we were out before sunrise to go birding. And uh, just before the sun came up, uh, everybody else was pointing the other direction with the sun at their back, uh, photographing birds that were starting to fly over with fairly long lenses and at fairly high ISOs. I turned the camera around and saw this opportunity at ISO uh, 640, uh, again, just before sunrise uh, at f2.8 with, uh, with that 28 millimeter wide angle. And I was able to get a shutter speed of 160th, 1 160th of a second to freeze the birds in flight. And again, uh, the advantage of uh, shooting wide is uh, moving subjects can be shot at a little lower shutter speed and they still look like they're frozen in motion. And again, that's just the physics of, of wide angle versus telephoto. And as you increase magnification, you are going to have to increase shutter speed as we talked about previously. Now, again, here's a great shot. I was, I was shooting uh, on uh, this is in Rocky Mountain National Park Trail Ridge Road, and I was photographing more of the of the uh, of the flora than of the fauna. But these elk were right there, uh, beautiful clouds in the sky, and there was a fence again to protect the animals from the humans, kind of. And uh, again, the elk were nicely framed in. So look for natural or man-made or human-made subjects or objects like this uh, to frame in things. If you're shooting with a wider angle lens, uh, it again, draws the viewer's eye more to the, uh, to, to the wildlife in the frame. So it doesn't always have to be about telephoto lenses. 
And again, just a few quick things. These are some captive animals. Shot this with the 45 millimeter Tamron lens, uh, wide open at f1.8, just to show you how shallow depth of field is, especially when you're very close to a subject. Uh, this is a Jackson's gecko kind of hanging out on a on a branch in a terrarium there. And believe it or not, again, I was at a birding festival at a trade show, and the booth next to ours was uh, a guy that owned lizards and small animals and would rent them out for photo shoots. And he was kind enough to let me take a few pictures of his of his geckos there in the trade show. And you can see the eye is nice and tack sharp and a little portion of the branch that it was resting on uh, was also sharp and everything else goes uh, out into the bokeh, that creamy soft out of focus area. Um, and if, you know, again, Tamron uses circular diaphragm blades so that they give you those creamy soft out of focus areas even when you're stopped down uh, so that's uh, that's a nice thing to think about too now i also went with the 35 millimeter uh f1.8 which has best in class close focus so i'm actually uh at now i'm closer at a, a 1 to 2.5 macro ratio at 7.9 inches uh from this little gecko uh, that's the minimum object distance, and that's measured from the film plane or the sensor uh, out to the subject. So I'm actually physically a little closer than that to the front of the lens. And I'm at about F8 here, so I've got a little more depth of field, a little closer, a little wider angle, and a little uh, stopped out a little bit. Gives you that little extra depth of field just to play with the with what we can do with lenses like that. And now we'll go to the telephotos, which are going to be the 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 bread and butter, the meat and potatoes, however you want to categorize it, of our uh, shooting arsenal, probably. Um, this was with the 70 to 210 millimeter, which is kind of one of the unicorns in Tamron's lens line. It's an F4 lens, and a lot of people think, I got to have a 2.8, I got to have a 2.8. Uh, the nice thing about the 70 to 210 is it's almost 30% smaller and lighter, substantially more affordable, too, especially right now. Tamron has uh, a nice uh, uh, at the register instant rebate on this lens. And it gives very, very close focus. Normally, you're not going to get this close to a sandhill crane. This was a, this was an unusual situation. There is a city park uh, in suburban Detroit. I think it's called Kensington Park, and the animals are very used to interacting with humans. In fact, for small birds, um, they they even will sell at their gift shop in the park. Uh, bird seed that you can put in your hand and attract small birds to, to land in your hand and, you know, do crazy close-up photos like that. But this sandhill crane literally walked right up to me looking, I think, for a handout. And uh, I was more uh, impressed with the uh, capability of the lens to be able to shoot a head, uh, head and deck portrait, not a head and shoulders portrait, of this sandhill at probably three, four, three and a half, four and a half feet away. So very, very close. And it filled up the frame very nicely. And again, uh, medium aperture here. I was at F5.6. So I was able to keep the uh, the bird uh, isolated from that very busy background that, that you can see. It's kind of out of focus. Uh, but because the bird is so nice and sharp, it it uh, it brings the uh, the viewer's eye right in there. And again, it's just a nice uh, mid focal range zoom to travel with. This was uh, uh, this was a nice elk, uh, not looking her best because she was shedding her winter coat, uh, but you can see that that uh, that early spring vegetation there. So uh, just coming out of winter time, but uh, she was just off the side of a road over a fence uh, grazing in this pasture and uh, posed for me momentarily. Again, kind of a medium aperture here. I was to get at f5.6 uh, to get a shot like that so I could isolate her again from the background there to, uh, to view, bring the viewer's eye closer. Uh, small wildlife again uh, with a mid mid-range telephoto, this frog in the pond uh, was uh, was croaking like crazy. Uh, uh, this was uh, in the springtime, and I presume he was looking for love, um, making those uh, making those croaking sounds that frogs make. Um, and again, I'm kind of fixated on f5.6. This, uh, this shot also was at 5.6. Um, and here I shot actually wide open uh, just to show, again, the closed focus capability of the 70 to 210, because you can get down to uh, a, one, a 1 to 3.5 or 3.7, I think, with that lens. So about a 4 by 6 inch area 
so that gives you an idea uh, with really no cropping. Uh, you have that lag bolt there in the uh, uh, in the railing of a uh, of a of a, a handrail and a fence. Uh, or on a walk, uh, a pedestrian walkway through a wetland. And I just saw this little spider and I thought, well, that's going to give me some scale and the ability to show off the close up capability of the lens, too. So just kind of one of those fun things. Keep your eyes open, even for small wildlife like that. Now, the 70 to 210 or the 70 to 200 28, again, gives you that brighter view, one stop faster. Um, here it didn't really come into play. Uh, late afternoon, kind of getting into the blue hour, the sun had uh, just gone down uh, and uh, this elk was a uh, big, nice bull elk. Late summer uh, was reclining here, just kind of chilling out in the afternoon. And I didn't really even see it in the viewfinder, but I got just that little hint of color to add a little, uh, a little something to the shot. Uh, but again, mid-range telephotos are going to be good for uh, just everyday shooting. Another very cool thing, the nice thing about a fast, even the f4 lens uh, or especially the f2.8 lenses is again being able to isolate a subject. Now this is at a at a preserve uh, out in uh, the the New Jersey Pennsylvania uh, borderline area, uh, Lakota Wolf uh, and Tamron. Again, if you're back east, we do workshops with them uh, in non-COVID years all throughout the year with a, you know, hosted by a variety of camera stores out kind of in that New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. But uh, this was shot um, uh, nearly wide open. This was shot at 2.8 and on a crop sensor camera. So a little extra magnification because of that smaller effective magnification because of the smaller sensor size. And this was also shot um, again, this is a, a captive animal, a rehabilitated animal, or, or an animal that can't be released back into the wild. Uh, that hash mark uh, pattern that you see in the background is actually a chain link fence. And that's the, that's the beauty of a larger aperture, f4, f2.8. You're going to be able to throw that background nicely out of focus, isolate on the subject. And even with a captive animal like this, it's going to look like, like uh, you got the, you know, the wildlife shot of the year uh, because you have filled up the frame nicely and you've isolated the animal uh, from the background. Um, this is another situation like that. Um, uh, here, it was actually shot through a fence. So there's actually a chain link fence between uh, the wolf and the photographer, of course. We want to protect the animals from the photographers. And uh, if you can get a little ways back, uh, or, or actually I should say reasonably close to a fence so that it's out of focus, it's, it actually was shot uh, closer than the minimum focus distance of the lens through the fence, that goes out of out of focus. Now, again, you want to hold your camera so that the camera is kind of viewing through a uh, a, a hole in the fence, uh, so that you're going to get the maximum area of sharpness. Because you know chain links again are going to be pretty small openings, so you you want to get reasonably close, but they don't let you get right up to the fence for obvious reasons. So again, uh, if you're shooting through fences, play with different apertures and you know physical distance. Uh, closer or further from the fence uh, to be able to eliminate it from the scene. And sometimes uh, you're driving along in the car and you're a passenger, which was the case here. My wife was actually driving and I was taking a couple of, of uh, visiting Tamron colleagues through Rocky Mountain National Park. And this elk was rambling along next to the side of the road and just happened to be licking his lips after he'd eaten some tender vegetation. So this was shot uh, from a moving car at a 500th of a second, ISO 400 at F11, uh, used just a a smidgen of exposure compensation uh, plus 0.7, 0 0.7 to get to the, uh, uh, because it was slightly backlit. Uh, as you can see there, the sun was kind of over its shoulder. And uh, just, you know, always, uh, always keep the camera handy. And uh, if you have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a nice family member who's willing to do the driving in situations like this, you know, so much the better. You can kind of lean out the window and get the cool shots and, uh, and have fun that way. Have you ever seen an alligator yawn? I hadn't until this afternoon. This is down um, outside of uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. 
and uh, in a in a swamp again we were with a, a a group of photographers leading a photo walk and uh this guy was sitting uh on a sandbar when we first happened upon the alligator all you could see were its eyes just kind of out of the water but uh he was bored uh, the hunting wasn't particularly good that afternoon i guess and he stood up and the jaw comes open, and as near as we can tell, it was a yawn, and he he opened it up and kind of slowly clamped it back down and then sunk back down to just the eyes out of the water. So, uh, again, uh, sometimes the, the photo needs a little storytelling to make, uh, to make it complete. There's uh, something in photography called tension and resolution. Now, when you have animals that are uh, like these, uh, these guys that are just kind of fighting for that spot on the beach, um, you know, maybe one was unhappy because the other one had caught more fish that day. Uh, they're just kind of, you know, fighting for a position on the beach. Uh, but a few minutes later, we have that resolution and everybody's happy. Uh, they've rolled over. They're kind of snuggling and snoozing. You know, maybe there was some amorous intent in that first frame. I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about uh, their behavior to tell for sure. But anyway, it was all worked out a few minutes later and they were snoozing and and always good. So sometimes look for tension, definitely look for resolution in your photos and have fun like that. Now at a shot like this, and I use this uh, shot in almost every webinar, if you've, if you've come and watched me before, you may have seen it a few times uh, in my birding and, and other wildlife and, and even landscape presentations, because uh, this is at the intersection of uh, a little planning, a little anticipation, a lot of patience, and a little bit of luck all coming together. Um, I had been stalking these great blue herons near where I live for, you know, in between work trips for a couple of weeks, and I was getting to where they were hunting in the afternoon after they'd already arrived. So when my car pulled off, you know, when we pulled the car off on the shoulder uh, of this county road right next to the wetlands where these guys were hunting, um, it would sometimes spook them or it would disturb them or they would, you know, hop a few feet away and, and get out of good photo range. So finally I thought, what happens if I get there maybe a half hour sooner before the birds start hunting in this spot for the afternoon? I knew where they roosted. I knew where they were coming from. So uh, instead of getting there at four o'clock, I got there at 3.30 one afternoon. And as luck would have it, the birds hadn't arrived yet. So I was able to set up the shot, do some test exposures, because as you can see, it's backlit. And uh, that's always going to be something where you're going to want to experiment with your exposure compensation. Again, this is something, uh, if you're not familiar with exposure compensation, uh, go to your camera body makers uh, tutorials on the web uh, or read about it in your owner's manual, although I think web tutorials are better for this, and learn how the controls work on your camera where to find them, and then uh, again, go out and experiment, play, and see what's going to work best for under or over exposing in a situation. A backlit subject like this, you're typically going to want to go to the plus settings. If the subject is spotlit, you want to go to the minus settings. So here, uh, the bird was going to be backlit. Uh, I set my exposure compensation to a plus 1.3. So I was overexposing one and a third stops because I wanted, again, that exposure to be right uh, on the wings and on its face. I had a little light reflecting up from the, uh, from the deadfall of the previous year's uh, cattails and stuff here. Uh, so I was lucky that the bird flew through that because it illuminated uh, the underside of the bird. But I, I was hoping, hoping mostly to nail that exposure of the, of the face and torso. And the rest of it was kind of uh, a little bit of luck. And I, uh, you know, I acquired the birds as I saw them flying in, uh, zoomed all the way out. And, and here's where you want to put your camera in the continuous frame advanced mode and probably also continuous autofocus. You may want to use spot focus or a center group focus. I use the uh, small center group in mine so that the camera can see a little bigger area but still lock in tight. 
And uh, if your camera has a tracking focus function, again, this is for the owner's manual or for the uh, or for the body makers tutorials. Certainly, you want to learn how to use that. Uh, and I I caught the birds, lock focus, and just started shooting little bursts as they got closer and closer and closer. Click 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 click, and then as the birds started to get very close, I isolated on one that looked you know again luck is involved. I was hoping it was the one that was going to fly closest to me, and it did. And uh, again, just tracked it across, kept panning, kept following, kept, uh, you'll notice it's slightly off center of the composition, and, and that's for a reason. You don't want it smack dab in the middle of the frame. Uh, makes for, you know, an okay composition. Off center is a, you, typically a slightly more successful composition. And uh, again, everything just kind of fell together. ISO 400, a 320th of a second. I didn't have to go to a real high shutter speed because I again I'd been studying the herons and they kind of glide in to land they're not flapping their wings all the way to the ground as some birds would so again study your subject matter and see what their behavior is too uh, so that you know especially with birds when they fly when they eat where they go to eat uh, where they roost what time they come to roost at night what time they leave the roost in the morning those sorts of things so you can you can get a variety of different kind of shots and the same with any other animal again most animals are going to be active birds are a little bit different but the big mammals uh, and reptiles and things like that typically are going to be active uh, early morning and late afternoon when it's a little bit cooler uh, and, uh, you know, maybe west, less wind blowing, those sorts of things. Uh, so that's important. Uh, this was, again, at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Reserve a few weeks ago. Um, uh, that warm color is from smoke in the air from the forest fires that we have here in Colorado. Um, this was shot like at two in the afternoon, but I got that late afternoon warm color uh, simply because of, of the unfortunate circumstance. But it was a very hot afternoon. These, these deer were resting kind of in the shade. So you see that mottled light uh, coming through the leaves of the trees. So I've got some exposure variation and this you kind of have to experiment with to see what's going to work. Uh, again, it was just off the side of the road at this wildlife preserve. So leaning out the window of the car again at 600 millimeters here. Uh, again, if you're shooting out of the car and you can stop, also turn the motor off because that vibration from the motor can really affect uh, how well a stabilizer works in your body or in a lens. So I was at 125th of a second leaning on the edge of the glass. Uh, and I actually, uh, I take, if I can reach it here, I can, I'll take little, uh, uh, pool foam and I'll cut it into like, uh, you know, you can buy one of these, they're three or four feet long, cut it in half, cut it half again. And I'll take a piece about that long, slice a hole in it and just lean that over the glass of the window. And it's a nice inexpensive way. You buy those at the dollar store for a buck or even at the pool store for four or five or $6. That's still a cheap investment and a great way to, to support the lens that way. And uh, just a, a fun thing to do. So again, uh, leaning on the window, 125th of the second, F8 ISO 100. So I was able to get that nice low ISO setting, sharp color, good contrast. And, uh, and again, the, the shade of the tree gave me some fairly even illumination. Uh, you can almost see me, my reflection in the moisture on the, uh, on the young buck's nose there. So that's kind of fun. An earlier trip to the arsenal uh, yielded this shot. This was last spring, and I uh, I was able to meet up with a, a juvenile bald eagle uh, that was again uh, hunting and had stopped to, on on this fence post uh, to look for maybe the afternoon meal. And it sat there again. I'm I'm at. Uh, not quite 600 millimeters. I was at 450 millimeters, but that more or less filled up the frame. Uh, eagles, of course, are large animals, and it it was kind of sitting there posing and you know acting bored. And it it started to ruffle its wings, and I thought, well, maybe it's going to launch, but the, it settled back down. But this made for a nice shot. And again, I was shooting. Uh, again, uh, in a continuous uh, burst mode. So click, 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 click when you fire the shutter so that if it did take off, I could pan with it for a little ways as it started to fly. Um, and it eventually did that. Uh, but 
uh, flew too fast, too quickly. Again, big birds fly faster than the than you think they do. Uh, but here, again, uh, slightly backlit, so I used a little exposure compensation. ISO 200 in this case, I was at 450 millimeters, 400th of a second at f11, and a plus 0 0.7 exposure compensation. Again, because of that bright sky and, and some clouds behind it too, um, again, that'll fool your light meter. So those sorts of things. This was last winter. Uh, again, I live in northern Colorado, just at the eastern edge of Fort Collins, and a huge uh, uh, family uh, of antelope, probably 200 animals, had uh, walked south from Wyoming looking for uh, uh, for food last December, and they were actually uh, coming, uh, you know, they'd crossed several major highways, and they were in a cornfield grazing and having a good time. Animals, uh, antelopes, and I've, I'd never been this close. I've, sh I've shot a lot of antelopes. Uh, this was at 600 millimeters, and this antelope was probably... 15 feet from my car. I was off on the shoulder of the road as it was grazing in this field. Um, and this is at 600 millimeters. And I had, a, I had put my, uh, my 150 to 600 on my Nikon Z6 to shoot this with the FTZ adapter. And again, perfectly native uh, functionality. That's again, kind of a cool thing as you're upgrading cameras. Some of your lenses can come along with you. And uh, uh, again, not all shots are going to want to be made horizontal. Uh, this lent itself very well to vertical. So if it looks good horizontal, always remember to shoot some vertical shots too, uh, as well. And, and they're going to give you more variety. And especially if you're thinking of publishing photos, again, uh, magazine pages are typically vertical. So again, uh, a, a photo editor might like a few vertical shots in a submission. So those, uh, those are things to consider. Again, late afternoon, this is that late afternoon, nice warm sunlight uh, coming across probably 20 or 30 minutes before sundown and uh, got that beautiful light happening. And that creates a nice portrait look. Again, you have the highlight side um, and the shadow side there. Uh, so again, just natural light portraits uh, that you can apply for kind of any shooting situation. And it worked very well. For uh, for this uh, for that uh, uh, that antelope. Now uh, hawks. These are young hawks. Again, they were kind of teasing me one afternoon. I, I spent a lot of time out at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal because it offers such a wide variety of wildlife, and it's uh, you know it's it's only an hour from where I leave. So like right now when I'm not traveling for work, I'm doing things virtually, I can still get out and do some shooting. Um, they put these things up on the uh, on the power lines and on telephone lines to try and prevent animals from landing so that, you know, when they take off to fly, they don't touch both wings on the, uh, on the power lines and cause problems for themselves uh, and for the power company's customers. But the birds don't know any better or they're just looking at me like, yeah, you're gonna make us move, buddy. And uh, that's, that's kind of the story behind that. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily like to see animals uh, roosting like that, but they'll, they'll do what they want to do. And a few minutes later, again, they got tired of me staring at them with my camera lens and they took off hunting. Uh, here's another uh, great blue heron hunting in the water. And again, with the 150 to 600, this is racked all the way out. And this is about a 50% crop. Sometimes you just physically can't get close enough to the animals. Uh, so again, with a good lens and a good sensor on your camera, again, a fairly low ISO. This was bright sunny day, ISO 200, middle of the afternoon, got that nice reflection off of a, a very small, slow uh, moving uh, river there. Uh, that the that the bird was hunting in, and it had just dipped down and and uh, grabbed something. You can see a little something in its beak there, and uh, the next shot was it kind of trying to uh, to to gobble it down and swallow it. So again, keep firing with the uh, uh, with continuous uh, frame advance in your camera for situations like this where the the animals are doing something interesting. Uh, again, a deer uh, a few uh, a few months ago. Uh, late afternoon at the uh, at the Arsenal Wildlife Preserve, again just uh, just grazing and stopped the car, and she kind of was grazing and and uh, didn't really look up at me. She was looking up off uh, past where we uh, we were parked, 
uh, but again, just kind of a nice, uh, soft lit late afternoon shot. Uh, so when you can, uh, deer will, will let you get physically pretty close. They're kind of, um, in, in populated areas where I live and where you might live. Again, they'll let you get fairly close. Uh, oftentimes, you know, stay in your car. Obviously you don't want to get out and start chasing them, uh, or hazing them. And, uh, this was first thing in the morning last uh last winter in uh, or early spring in uh, this was actually in yellowstone uh this was uh 10 minutes into the park from the west yellowstone entrance and this bison and its calf uh had just stood up to start uh walking along for the day so they still have as that frost was uh, there on the uh on all the plants again they'd been resting and had frost to uh, form on their backs overnight too so uh again planning and uh execution and luck and again this is out uh out of a vehicle rolled a window down it was like the temperature was in the teens at the time it was brisk outside uh but uh again one of those things that uh that uh, you drive slowly through national parks or where places where wildlife are going to be. And those early morning, late afternoon uh, times of day are going to give you those surprises. Now, again, back to the arsenal. Uh, this is a heavily crop shot. This was, uh, this is probably a 60 or 70% crop of uh, a hitchhiker on the top of a bison. This is a, a female uh, brown-headed cowbird kind of hitchhiking or along for the ride on the bison's back. And uh, the bison was just kind of slowly walking along and uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, particularly bothered by the bird riding on its back. Again, this was one of those late afternoon scenes where we had a lot of forest fire smoke in the air. So uh, again, that warm color, uh, you know, actually about four o'clock in the afternoon uh, was not from the late afternoon sunset light. It was, it was from uh, atmospheric conditions at the time with the, uh, uh, with the wildfires here in Colorado. So uh, uh, you take advantage of a bad situation sometimes to get interesting looking light. Um, this <laughs> meadowlark was actually staring at me, standing on a hand carved headstone in a cemetery. So you, you find your animals wherever they are. Again, a backlit subject, uh, ISO 200. Uh, here I used a full stop of backlit compensation because it was so uh, heavily backlit. And you can see that nice rim lighting over its over the top of the back of the bird there. Uh, just kind of a fun thing. So uh, even urban wildlife, you know, uh, this this was at uh, an old cemetery in an older uh, in an older town near where I live in northern Colorado. But uh, you look for those opportunities wherever they present themselves. Also, you're going to get good shots sometimes at zoos. Uh, this animal, again, backlit, a little compensation for exposure. Um, actually, with this one, I just, I switched my camera. Normally, I leave my camera in its, in its matrix metering or, or what Canon calls evaluative metering. I did use spot metering here uh, just so I could get that nice uh, spot color tone of this backlit elephant. And it was giving itself a, a, a mud bath that afternoon. Uh, so uh, zoos are a great place to go to, to photograph uh, animals and you know better zoos uh, are going to give uh, uh, are going to give great uh, uh, photo opportunities. They're they're building habitats that that look more realistic for the animals to live in and also make great photo opportunities for photographers. Uh, we'll talk quickly about the all-in-one zooms. I'm coming up on time here. Uh, the 18 to 400. Again, this uh, this uh, mountain lion puma was at a uh, at a at a zoo that has done a very nice uh, job of making habitats uh, ha habitable for the animals that are uh, that are in their collection. Again, this was a rescued animal. It had been injured and and couldn't be released back in the wild. Uh, but again, a nice overcast day gave me that nice soft light. And again, they're going to get you closer. Uh, two beautiful animals uh, that are well fed and well cared for that look healthier than a lot of animals in the wild do sometimes. That being said, again, urban wildlife, this, uh, this burrowing owl, uh, this was on the, uh, uh, um, uh, in a vacant lot behind a church in, uh, on the western uh, side of Florida a year or so ago, and uh, just kind of peeking out 
uh, and it wasn't a particularly natural setting. So again, a tight crop in camera uh, gave it that, uh, that kind of look. Uh, one more shot with the 18 to 400. Again, uh, broad, uh, flat light on a nice sunny day in the afternoon at the uh, at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Again, back to the same zoo that I caught that uh, wildcat at. Uh, this bear. This is again one of those shots through a fence. I was far enough back through a fence, and the fence had bigger holes. Uh, it wasn't like a chain link fence, and there were two layers of fence. So again, it took a little uh, manipulating to get a clear shot through the fence. And you can see uh, slight softness there right in that part of the frame. And that's that out of focus uh, piece of fencing material. But uh, I got the eye centered and it's nice and tack sharp. So again, until that's something that soft part is pointed out to you, uh, you may not even notice it or view your viewer may not notice it in a, in a finished photo. The other cool thing about uh, all of the Tamron lenses is they have best in class close focus. So with the 18 to 400, which stays on my on my camera most of the time because it's so versatile, wide angle, long telephoto and close up capability all in one. I get beautiful shots of butterflies, bees on flowers. Uh, you can get shots like this. Again, this is in a, in a wildlife preserve down in Texas, shooting through a fence. And I couldn't quite completely throw the background fence out of focus, but it's soft and, and you could, if you wanted to, clean that up in post, I suppose. I didn't for this, just more to show off what it could do. And then you can go on a, a lot of places in the country have wildlife preserves where they'll have collections of, of animals from other continents and they'll you know put you on trams or trains uh, or trolleys that you, can, that you can go through the preserve. So it's not always about catching them in nature. Uh, this was, I was, I was doing a portrait Photoshop, uh, a photo workshop in Florida, and we were taking a break in between sessions, walked outside and saw this, uh, uh, this little critter hanging from the edge of a tree uh, next to a busy street in, uh, in Palm Beach, Florida. So you never know where you're going to find things. Again, the 14 to 150 for micro four thirds, a great little lens uh, for the Olympus and, uh, and Panasonic users. Macro lenses. Tamron makes a 90 millimeter macro uh, that will get to life size if you need it to, as I did with this little ladybug uh, huddling up for warmth uh, one early fall morning. I found this uh, again happenstance. I was driving through the mountains. Uh, one of those flashing signs said road construction ahead, come around another corner. The next sign says blasting, uh, expect a 30 minute delay. And I was the second car in line. So I knew I was going to have that 30 minute delay and uh, got out and started walking around on the hillside and, uh, and found that again, look all around. This was, you know, on a, on a, on a wildflower on the side of the mountain that was like, you know, a foot tall and it had, it had closed up for the night and the ladybug had huddled up for warmth for overnight uh, right there too. Again, uh, a lizard at a, uh, at a botanic garden, uh, just a simple shot like that. This uh, praying mantis I found on a handle on my garage door and it was kind enough to pose for me for about 10 minutes. And again, the camera is handy. I always try and keep my camera handy. Uh, just some more quick uh, tips for zoos. Go early or late, and this, this goes for all wildlife, really. Um, get a map or download a map of the venue. Pack light. Carry only the lenses that you think you're going to need. Uh, it's not a bad idea to bring polarizers uh, in a monopod, maybe a rubber lens shade to get up against uh, the glass, as you'll see in some shots here. You may not be able to completely eliminate the fencing. Uh, this is still kind of an interesting shot of a turkey vulture uh, at that same venue. Uh, this bobcat, I had a nice, uh, I had a nice uh, view over a berm, so that the uh, so that the guests are above the animals, and you have a nice clear photo shot. Uh, these shots were at the Seattle Zoo, uh, so you know, just up the road away from uh, from Glazers, well, a few hours away. Uh, this was uh, at the Brooklyn Zoo, and this is with uh, the new 70 to 300. One of my colleagues uh, got out, uh, had a very early sample, the first one that hit the United States, and uh, he had a chance to go out and shoot for an afternoon with the new lens. Uh, so again, 
think about where the light's coming from, you know, get direct front light, maybe backlight, uh, maybe some nice crossing light. And again, uh, uh, animals like this in, uh, in more natural looking habitats. Again, this is a, a captive uh, burrowing owl at a, at a zoo. And uh, you would think that, uh, that it was out uh, glaring back at you. Uh, um, in a in a more uh, natural setting, open shade is always a great thing. Again, that soft overhead light, uh, or where you get nice directional light, that beautiful dynamic range. Uh, there was uh, you know, light coming down through the trees, and it almost uh, spotlit this flamingo against an ugly background. But the background was so dark, and the flamingo was so light that again, the camera exposed for the flamingo background goes dark. And uh, again, those kinds of things are, are fun to look for. Now, again, using a polarizer when you're shooting through glass will reduce glare and reflections and, uh, and also works great at aquariums. A rubber lens shade, which is a very inexpensive thing you can get at the camera store, just goes on uh, threads into the filter threads on the front of the lens and you can get right up against the glass. And again, you, you miss all those reflections quickly. Tamron does make uh, teleconverters. We have a 1.4 and a two times. Uh, uh, this, they can cause uh, the camera's ability to autofocus. They can cost that because of light loss. So you can increase magnification, but there is some downside. Uh, but again, can't get close enough to, the, to a coyote like that that had just caught its afternoon meal uh, with the 150 to 600. So through the 1.4 converter on and uh, was able to get, again, uh, a nice environmental portrait of a coyote doing what they do. Again, one quick last thing with stabilization, not a great photo. This, this uh, buck was peering through uh, some some weeds at me that he was kind of nibbling on, but uh, just wanted to show with the 1.4 teleconverter handheld at an 80th of a second. So Tamron match converters, and they only fit four of our telephotos. They're matched just to those four lenses, the, uh, the 150 to 600, the 100 to 400, uh, the 70 to 210, and the 70 to 200. Um, and this was manually focused because it was uh, such a dark situation. But again, handheld at an 80th of a second at 600 millimeters uh, with the car motor turned off. Uh, and I got a, a sharp shot. So again, use the right tools. When you're out in nature, uh, don't chase the animals around. Don't climb over fences uh, as this guy had done just, you know, in his uh, tromping across the prairie tundra there that can take decades, uh, you know, from human footprints tromping across it to, uh, to repair itself. So stay on the trails. Use the long lens to get the shots. Uh, don't be that guy. Again, uh, I, I know I've read a little bit over. Thanks so much to our hosts at, at Glazers. Uh, congratulations on 85 years. Again, a family-owned business right in your community. We'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Again, I'm Tamron Tech Jeff. All right, Jeff, and thank you for that. Uh, lots of great you. information. I love that you had a little bit to get people started. Um, on just some photo basics and then sharing all those examples. Um, we actually don't really have any questions and I've asked them a couple of times. I did, I did a little post a moment <laughs> ago to say, hey, if you've got questions, we'll probably be doing some Q&A soon. And um, basically a few of the people tuning in already own Tamron lenses and they're talking about like uh, John Cornicello's like, I love my 18 to 400. It's great for my M5. And um, one of the guys is definitely interested in checking out the 150 to 600 after you shared those samples. Um, and I did uh, just a reminder to folks, we do have a rental department. So if you're not quite ready to make the investment, um, lots of these lenses are potentially available in our rental department. Um, so you could give rentals a call, check them out. Um, and that's also just a great way in general to try gear before you make that investment um, yeah. because and, and lenses are just, definitely an investment. Yeah, speaking from a customer standpoint, you have one of the best rental departments on the West Coast. Oh, thank um, you. Again, you know, I've, I've occasionally gotten gear at Glazers when I was in town too. So um, yeah. that's, that's a big thing. And again, try it uh, if you want to before you buy it. 
um, a great uh, a great strategy for a lens if you're not sure you want to you want to plop down the bucks. Although again, Tamron lenses are pretty affordable. That's one of the things that uh, our business model uh, does well. We've got uh, one of the best staffs of optical engineers in the business, uh, but because we do a lot of OEM manufacturing that I can't even talk about, um, we are able to sell. Uh, top-notch lenses that, again, test reports will bear out uh, lens after lens, year after year. You're, you're not settling for buying a Tamron lens. You're getting a first-class uh, piece of optical equipment that's going to perform well. It's going to perform natively on your camera, and, and that's the, the important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, with all that said and with all that covered, um, and uh, with you guys who are tuning in being quiet with your questions or he just covered it all so well you didn't have any questions that you came up with. Um, we're going to wrap this session up for today. Um, if you did sign up, you just probably got a little note with that super secret promotion I mentioned earlier. Um, those promotions in some cases may be happening all week. Um, if you haven't received it yet, just be sure to sign up and we're going to be sending emails throughout the week with uh, whatever special promotions that might be happening on lenses are going on. Um, the party's not over. We have tons of programming this week. I kind of went crazy when I did the programming this week. I'm going to be hosting sessions six days this week. Um, and we have, on most days, we have at least two sessions. So check out the full schedule, glazerscamera.com backslash anniversary. Go check it out. Sign up for the sessions. Get those emails to not only learn, but get some great deals while we're doing all of this. So thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Ben, thank you. for uh, hanging out in the background there. Um, and thank you, Tamron, for uh, helping to make these kinds of events happen. We are super grateful. Um, for all of you tuning in, like I said, uh, we hope to see you later this evening when we have our next session that starts at 6 p.m. And um, I'll wish everyone a happy afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs>